Yeah, but we're still waiting for graduates. Um, the Queen Mary University of London. Um, we are happy to have you here today. And um, we have a panelist of uh, very experienced um, litigators and um, distribution experts um, discussing uh, various topics such as access to justice, timeliness, quality, and the cost of justice. Um, whether rules of court um, or, or procedural um, technicalities help in the um, access to justice, and um, what is the role of ICT and electronic filing system, as well as effectiveness of arbitration in the Nigerian context. We also have um, discussions on small claims courts as well as the independence of the judiciary. Uh, my name is Adipsi Sonda. Um, on, on the panelists, we have Isaiah Bozimo, who is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, as well as um, the Attorney General of Delta States. He is represented by his um, special assistant, Christopher Awo Dimila. We also have on um, the call, Prenami Momodu, who is a seasoned dispute resolution expert with several years of experience and is partner in the leading law firm of Alex. We also have Folaon Ajayi, a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and legal manager at He is also a CCLS Nigeria committee member. We also have Moyo. Osho, who is a partner in the firm of MJ Onigbanjo and Co. is also a seasoned dispute resolution expert. Moderating today's session is Ridwan Belo, a partner in Shobowale, Medidem, and Belo. I would hand over um, um, Ridwan Belo. Uh, thank you very much, BC. And I mean, just a minute. Um, today happens to be for Laho and um, Moyo's birthdays. So happy birthday to both of you. And sorry for dragging you out. <laughs> happy, happy birthday, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Moyo, are you really fit for Laho and Moyo? Yeah, well, yeah. You come around now. You know my office. There is always fry and chicken. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very you. much for the best wishes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, BC. Um, I think uh, the introductions have been made. And I think at this point, it's best to you know, get straight into it. Uh, BC has um, outlined the topics that uh, we'll be discussing on this webinar, on this roundtable. Um, so the first of the topics is um, access timelines quality and cost of justice. Um, I would be um, discussing this with um, Folaho and Christopher. So, um, I mean, we all know um, access to justice is an essential appendage of the rule of law. And one would be right to say effectiveness of a court judicial system, right, can be measured by the efficacy of its access to justice. So for Laho, in your opinion, do you think we have achieved access for a large majority of Nigerians? And what would you say is the major role of lawyers in improving access to justice? Um, so like, thank you for the question. Um, can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, um, so access to justice um, in Nigeria for Nigerians. Um, I think um, you might say the jury is still out on that, but um, I think that um, to to a large extent we, we might have um, achieved, you know, um, you know, relative access to justice for um, a large majority of Nigerians. Um, and there are certain indices that you would look at and. Um, some of those things would include, um, for instance, um, 
the cost of filing, um, access to legal practitioners. And um, you would also look at, I mean, you start from the beginning, you look at the end, uh, and you look at matters such as even enforcement of judgment, because ultimately um, the road to um, getting justice would start from the moment when uh, the claim is filed or even at the point where demand letters are written mm -hmm. up to the point whereby you go to trial and judgment is delivered and then you, you try to you know, enforce the judgment. Um, so for, I mean, if you look at the, I mean, the economic, I mean, economic reports that we have in Nigeria and um, even our current reality, you know, where um, the Naira is being constantly devalued. You know, I think that some of the gains that um, we had achieved um, in the past, um, some of those gains are gradually getting eroded. Um, in as much as um, filing a claim, um, let's say with the exception of Lagos, so in as much as filing a claim in most of Nigeria is, I mean, relatively affordable. Um, I think for an average claim, I mean, you could actually succeed in filing for less than 10,000 naira. Um, I make Lagos an exception because um, as all of us would know, I mean, Lagos um, has done a number of upward reviews of its um, filing fees. And um, one important thing that he did actually was to, you know, sort of told the part of arbitration, which is to uh, make your filing fee, you know, a a percentage of what your claim is. And um, I think the arguments for and against that, you know, but ultimately what it would mean, particularly in a personal injury claim, for instance, where uh, the claimant might not be a person of means, mm -hmm. but um, is deserving of significant general damages, made up for negligence for new terms or you know, just personal injury. So that claimant, you know, ultimately would not be I'm able to file the claim, you know, if, if in that case, um, the facts are such that, you know, they should get a, 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 um, damages to the tune of 200 million naira, for instance. So if you approach Lagos State High Court, they will calculate your fees, you know, based on what you're claiming. Um, while in practice, I've had a client who, um, under a contract, rightfully, you know, wanted to claim um, about 2 billion naira. You know, so we, we took that, you know, claim to the court. And, you know, when we came back to, um, to the client, you know, with the filing fees, uh, till I left the firm, that client never filed because, you know, they just didn't see why, you know, they should spend that amount of money. And mean as much as that client might have been able to afford it, you know, the clients, you know, that may, not be afford, that may not be able to afford it. So that turns out to be an access issue. Uh, the, um, the other access issue that I think that we have you know, is um, cost of legal representation. And um, I think one of the ways, you know, by which I think the legal system has sort of addressed that is um, we have more and more lawyers that are willing to have contingency fee arrangements. So you have claimants that have been able to, you know, you know successfully litigate their claims, you know, at the high court, sometimes even all the way to the Supreme Court without having to, you know, pay a dime. You know, once they reach an agreement with the lawyers on, you know, um, they get a percentage of what they're able to recover. You know, they're able to, you know, sort of afford, you know, the proceedings. You know, so I think um, that has been, I mean, that has been dealt with. You know, depending on, you know, if you find a lawyer that's willing to, you know, to um, to get into that sort of arrangement. And um, I think for lawyers, um, one of the reasons why. You know, I as a lawyer might even, you know, think twice about getting to those sort of arrangements. I mean, depending on who the defendants are, you know, many times when the defendant is a um, governmental agency or federal or a federal or state government, um, you will think, you know, a lot about enforcement, and you would remember the, you know, the the principle or even the judicial precedent to the fact that, you know. You would need, you know, the consent of the attorney general before, you know, a governmental account could be attached. You know, so you have basically several judgments that have not been enforced, and um, they might never be enforced, you know, in this life, basically. So, I mean, if you remember all of that, you would, you would think twice about getting into a contingency arrangement when, you know, the, the defendant has, you know, some sort of um, governmental relationship. Yes. Um, um, do I go to quality of justice as just um, stay with access? 
Well, let's do it access for now. Let's do it okay. access. Um, okay. I'd I'd like to come to um Christopher, right? Um, I mean, uh, to to us, we all know this that one of the most damaging aspects of our judicial process is the time it takes to secure justice. You know, the saying, justice delayed is justice denied. Um, um, how would you characterize the progress the Nigerian judicial system has made in terms of timelines? Well, okay, so thank you very much, uh, Ridwan. And uh, before I start, I would like to, you know, once again, I mean, just convey the um, unreserved apology of the Honorable Attorney General, who has a state function right now. That's why he's absent in this event, or well, is with us in spirit. <laughs> so uh, let me just go straight uh, to the point. So I think for me, I, I, th I think it's better if we look at it from the fact that there's a notion that most people feel access to justice is the same thing as access to the courts. So uh, it's that the problem with that notion is that sometimes we place so much emphasis on the formal. Can you hear me? I don't know if my audio is good. Hello. No, yes. 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 Sorry, I, okay, you can hear me. All right. So the problem is that it, it kind of we place a lot of you know focus or reforms on just the formal justice system and then we ignore the efficiencies or probably the solutions that the informal justice system also affords, which includes uh, you know, alternative dispute resolution. So I'll give you a classic example that um, the Attorney General most time he uses. Um, so there, there's this case that uh, you know, the cause of action actually arose in 1982 between there, was, there were these four, um, what are the four communities in Delta State, in the old Bendel State then, and they had a, they had a dispute with um, SPDC Shell. Then in 1983, they actually approached um, Mr. Isaiah's father, that's the AG's father, and um, instituted an action in the High Court of Bendel State. As at that time, the AG was, the AG's mom was pregnant, and that was the AG, <laughs> you understand? Then in 1997, um, the High Court of Delta State now gave judgment in favor of the four communities awarding about 30 million, something, um, 30.2 million uh, damages in their favor. Um, Shell went to the Court of Appeal and in 2002, the Court of Appeal dismissed the appeal. Then they appealed again to the Supreme Court. And in 2015, Mr. Isaiah was the one that argued the appeal. As of 2015, that was already 33 years. Mr. Isaiah from the baby. From yes. The yes, he was the one that settled the appeal, that argued the brief and got judgment again. The, the disputes, I mean, the, the, the Supreme Court actually dismissed the appeal once more. Now, it, it might seem kind of interesting, but it's not actually funny. As of 2015, 75% of the plaintiffs were dead. That's the people who actually instituted the action our representative of the four communities, about 88% of the value of that 30 million was gone. You understand? And then it took 30, 33 years. I mean, people might argue that probably that is just an August situation. But I mean, cases, the, 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 time that, the timeline it takes, you know, to, to get justice, because in that case, one way or the other, there's justice, but that's not the justice that the people, you know, the four communities expected. You get so people want justice to be, you know, dished out in the most efficient and effective manner. So, personally, or in Delta State, here, what we are trying to do is identify that primarily, if you look at it broadly, there are like guiding principles to, you know, um, ensuring that there's efficient access to justice. So, the first thing is that you make sure that justice is accessible, people have information about what they need to do, what are the options that they have. And also justice is um, appropriate. I mean, the, the system or the, you know, what you are proposing to a party, is it, is it appropriate for that dispute? Is, is it litigation that is the best thing? Is it arbitration or mediation? Are the parties really hostile? Then is it effective? Then is it also efficient to the extent that will it be final? So things like that, so these are considerations or guidelines that we think. Um, from, I can't really tell you so much. I can't speak authoritatively for, 
the entire country. But I can say what we are doing in Delta State is that we have, currently we have a bill that is before the Delta State House of Assembly. We call it the Delta State Administration of Civil Justice Bill. And primarily in that bill, we, the, 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 the aim of that bill is to, you know, to, to help or to promote the efficient you know, dispensation or administration of um, civil proceedings. And primarily we do it in three ways. First thing there is access to information, early access to information. So the bill actually gives the chief judge the power to create an ADR information scheme, which informs the parties of the cost of mediation, the fact that at any point during proceedings, they can ask for legal advice on ADR. And um, it also provides for the scheme is supposed to provide for uh, the types of ADR that are kind of suitable for their dispute and all that. Then secondly, it also gives the parties, the bill also gives the parties the right to take early actions like pre-litigation requirements. There is this current trend in some countries, I think, I can't remember the country now, where before you can go to, is it Ireland? Before you can go to this, before you can, you can commence an action, there's a compulsory mediation session that you, you attend. It's 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 not it's not it's not really forceful. It's not uh, a thing that uh, you know. It's not you're not denying them access to court. But what what that system does is, it's just like an information session. So you have a mediator who probably is employed by the state, or you know. Um, so the mediator just explains the advantages of mediation to the parties, and they're they're now it's now left to them to say, okay, I think we should mediate our dispute, or we should not. So that bill also kind of introduces that, gives parties that option to take early actions to, you know, um, settle out their dispute before, and, and also restrict the issues for determination, agree on some things, you know, during case, effective case management options to make sure that, you know, they are not, things that ought not to be, you know, contained in the pleadings or things that ought not to be argued by the parties are not really there. Then lastly, appropriate classification. So, one thing that I think delays justice, administration of justice in Nigeria is the fact that the court to a large extent plays a passive role due to our adversarial system. You understand that most times the main actors, even if it's, it's people might argue that it's the court, but I don't think it's the court, I think it's counsel. You can see counsel, if there's a little thing, counsel is appealing, counsel is doing this, there are a lot of, you know, uh, guerrilla or dilatory tactics that people can employ to just or seek frivolous adjournment. But the bill that we are proposing tries to contain that and gives the court a more active role in managing the case. So those, that, that's just what, what I'll say from my end. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Christopher. Um, um, for long, I would, uh, I would like to come back to you and, and talk a little about, about the cost of of, of access to justice. Um, do you think that the constitution makes adequate provisions guaranteeing access to justice for the poor? I mean, looking at the fact that the vast majority of people charged with crimes in Nigeria, and even as in many countries, cannot afford private counsel. And also, do you think that a balance can be struck between um, lawyers' re remuneration and reduced cost of justice for indigent litigants. Thank you, Chola, for this uh, question. Um, so I think the first thing that I would say is um, um, we might need to you know, draw a distinction between um, criminal and civil cases. And I think for criminal cases, you know, when you have you know, an accused in the dock, I think it is um, fairly settled that, uh, you know, they are entitled to some, you know, some form of um, legal representation, and that's why, um, in um, in several departments in the state ministry of, uh, in the ministry of justice of various states, you know, you have the office of the public defender. Um, that's the name in Lagos. Um, I think other states might, you know, have other acronyms for it. But essentially, what they do is to um, provide, you know, um, lawyers to defend. Um, accused, um, particularly in cases where um, the accused is standing trial for murder and um, you know those sort of um, capital offenses. And um, there's been, I think, enough case law where you know the Supreme Court has had to overturn you know a conviction you know on the basis that 
the accused, you know, didn't have access to um, legal representation or effective legal representation. And the latter is actually another point, you know, that, you know, that we need to consider is often being considered because many times what happens is um, the lawyers that um, that are assigned, you know, tasks for um, by the OPD, you know, sometimes they are youth coppers, you know, sometimes they are inexperienced lawyers. So, in as much as um, yes, the accused, you know, receive legal representation, but if the legal representation in actual in, in effect or you know in actual sense of it, you know, amounts to um, no legal representation. So we, we might have, you know, the same problem there. So it's, um, I think it's work in progress, you know, I think for, I think we've moved on, we've moved on from a situation where, you know, an accused, a, 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 a suspect, you know, accused of murder could go through um, a trial without any legal representation to um, having, you know, some legal representation today, you know, albeit um, ineffective legal representation. Um, so that's for criminal cases. Um, for civil cases, um, I think I've touched on um, um, some of these points, you know, when I spoke earlier, which is that for civil cases, I mean, when you have um, indigent applicants or applicants that are not able to, you know, afford, um, um, they're not able to afford legal representation, not being able to afford, you know, the cost of filings, you know, the rules of professional conduct, you know, permit legal, um, legal practitioners to, you know, take on these cases on a contingency, you know, fee basis. And we might need to, I think that, you know, we might need to sort of address, you know, some of these concerns because um, to ensure that, you know, there's justice for all, um, I, I don't think that, you know, as a state, as a country, we should assume that, you know, um, a litigant that, um, needs to get access to the courts, um, needs to litigate a claim, would always be able to, you know, um, sign a contingency fee agreement with the lawyer. It, it, it might not be able to. So um, we do need to um, consider, uh, you know, the cost of filings. Um, there are a lot of, you know, bureaucratic um, obstacles that you find, you know, in filing a claim. You know, when you file, you have to mobilize the court bailiff um, even though, you know, when you paid for your filing fees, uh, service is one of the things that you paid for. You know, interestingly, you know, the process would never get served until you mobilize the bailiff. And, you know, when you have someone that isn't of means, you know, that becomes an obstacle effectively. So those sort of issues, you know, have to be looked at, you know, um, effectively. And I think one, of, one balance that I think that um, we need to um, sort of draw, or we need to ensure is to, um, so or let me put it this way, you know, in as much as we need to ensure access, we need to also sort of um, um, reduce or discourage, you know, frivolous actions, because um, we should have access for legitimate claims and not for frivolous claims. And I think um, it might be one of the reasons why Lagos State, for instance, um, introduced you know, that system of filing where they introduce you know, a percentage of your claim. So if you are going to sue you know, someone for 500 billion naira, you know, when you're confronted with the filing fees, you, you would think twice about, can you actually you know, get a judgment for 500 billion naira? And I mean, if you have to pay 2 million naira, you know, I've, I've seen um, while in practice, we received you know, a bill, you know, for two, um, filing fees of about two, you know, million. And I have to say that to the client that um, if you are interested in pursuing this claim, you know, you have to pay this separately. You know, um, this is not going to be part of our professional fees. You know, so we do need to, you know, draw a line. You know, in as much as you know, we are pushing for access. You know, access for all Nigerians. But um, part of the issues that we have, you know, uh, a lot of our courts have, you know, a large case docket, um, several cases, you know, on the cost list. But a lot of these cases, you know, a lot of these cases are frivolous. It should be told. A lot of these cases are speculative. A lot of these cases are gold digging. That's the simple fact. And um, we shouldn't encourage those sort of, you know, claims because ultimately what it does is it clogs the court's docket. You know, the time that will have been spent hearing legitimate cases will be spent on cases that are absolutely going nowhere. 
you know, you go to trial, the judge has to write a judgment, you know. So we need to discourage, you know, those sort of actions, you know, through punitive significant cost. I mean, that is well settled in, in, um, um, in England, you know, in the US. There's one case that I remember very well in the US where um, someone sued, you know, an arbitrator, you know, for whatever reason. And um, um, the court is dismissing that claim, you know, said, you know, there's enough case law, you know, it's, 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 it's everywhere that, you know, arbitrators enjoy, you know, immunity. And then, you know, in, despite being aware, you know, of, you know, those well laid down principles, you brought this action and the cost awarded cost of $50,000, you know, against the council, against the party. So I think we need to get a point where, you know, cost is awarded against council, cost is awarded against parties. So that the cases that we have, you know, are legitimate cases. And, and then I think it will be easier to, you know, to address, you know, the access issues. And remuneration of, you know, legal practitioners and um, which, you know, I think also is also tied to the access issue. And unfortunately it's tied to our economic issues because um, lawyers must get paid. Um, I mean, truth be told, um, it's not, it's not cheap, you know, becoming a lawyer. It's not, um, it's not, um, legal books are not cheap. I mean, there's nothing about legal profession that is cheap and someone has to pay for it. And a lot of times you know, it's, the least, it's the litigants that has to pay for it. Um, so that being the case, um, if um, the economy is such that, you know, um, the, earnings of, the earnings of lawyers, you know, if there's that sort of, if it's disproportionate with, uh, let's say the affordability of, um, of the services that they offer or the ability of, you know, clients and litigants to sort of um, pay for the services. And I think that the court, I think that um, the, um, the Nigerian Bar Association um, and other, you know, stakeholders have to, and they have to step in. I recall um, one of the candidates in um, the, in the, uh, the presidential and the elections, um, not the last one, one before this one. And I think one of the points that we can vast that I think um, that I that I really liked and I was going to and I voted for him for that reason. But I was going to meet with um, relevant stakeholders, I was going to meet with um, um, CIBN, you know, Institute of um, Tax Practitioners, Institute of um, Bankers. And, it, and I was going to say that, you know, we need to agree on a fee for lawyers. You know, there's certain fees that cannot be paid to lawyers basically. So if it's going to be for searches, if it's going to be for ganshi, you know, lawyers must not be able to accept, you know, fees that are beyond, you know, all of this, you know, you know, if we are able to, you know, achieve that on some level, you know, I think lawyers, you know, will get better payments. And I think that that in itself would improve um, access to justice. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that one. Um, I mean, with that, I would quickly um, come to Moyo. Um, I'd like to talk to you on uh, the rules of court and procedural technicalities. Um, our rules of court, um, are, are they reflective of modern best practices globally? Moyo, you are still muted. Thank you, Midwan. Yeah, the problem is with um, the rules of court. And again, like everybody has said, it, there's been various examples of the rules of courts in various jurisdictions. I would like to restrict myself to Lagos now because I'm very familiar with the rules of courts in Lagos. And I think to some, uh, to some extent, the rules of courts in Lagos have been designed in a way that um, it hates for speedy, determination of action, though that is the intention when those when the chief judge and the committees of judges who made the rules, when they made the rules, that was their intention to provide an easy access to justice and a speedy access to justice. But you will discover that sometimes it is easier to read the rules on paper than apply it because the rules are designed in a way that they want it's to for anybody that is that if you are if you are using the rules, you can at least say that okay, within a specific period of time, you are able to achieve, you are setting yourself milestones that you're 
when I file this action within 42 days, I expect the defendant to respond. And within maybe some days, I expect to file the response. But you see that it raises more questions because the rules are there, but to a large extent, the human resources to make the rules work are absent. If there is a rule that says you have to do something within a certain time, and you expect that, yes, if I fulfilled my obligation by filing and doing this within some certain time, then there should be the reciprocal effort from the other, and that is the judiciary, to make sure that they hear the matter within that certain time. But it is not like that because the rules provide for something else, but in practice, we really cannot achieve what these rules provide for. So it is a problem that there is the rules there, but the applicability and practicability of the rules is not something that the human resources that are available ensures. So to that extent, that is why sometimes the rules are seen as um, aiding technicality rather than substantial justice. But that's in fact is not the case. The rules are straightforward and they are even to they provide access. But the problem is that the human resources to make the rules work are not available. For example, like um, Fola said, the numbers of cases on the docket of justices in the High Court of Lagos State, sometimes you get to the court and you can see on the cost list of the judge, they would say about 30 something cases. So how do you expect a, um, a judge to give them the practical with the access you want when you are in court and maybe one of the cases is taken up to 45 minutes, 50 minutes, then it becomes a problem that well, it may be you are not sure that the court is even going to entertain your case that day. So it is not a problem of the rules of court. I think the problem is the human resources have been able to make the rules work. I would give you an example. Um, for example, in Lagos State, um, like the Folar or Folar Sunday, there is an alternative dispute resolution mechanism in the rules of court in Lagos State. And it's like it's almost mandatory that if there is an opportunity for settlement, you must explore it. And for example, if you are in a dispute resolution and you are checking, you are trying to use the alternative dispute resolution. And the uh, defendant in the matter has offered you a certain sum for settlement. But as the claimant, you do not accept the terms and you feel maybe by the time the matter goes to trial, you will be able to get a higher sum. Eventually, if you refuse settlement and settlement becomes unsuccessful and you go to trial, at the end of the day, by the time the judge determines the matter and the judgment sum that is awarded to you is lesser than what the defendant has proposed to you during the settlement. That means some costs are going to be awarded against you for the time you've wasted and you have not accepted that certain judgment sum that was offered. So to some extent, that's just an example, I'm sorry, to some extent, the rules are mechanism in them that makes it very fast for matters to go on. But on the other hand, we do not have enough hands to make these rules work. So I think to address that, we might come back to the aspect of the administration of justice, which requires for more judges and for more experienced court registrars and other things to be appointed. Because unless we have that, there is no rule that can be made that maybe to some extent, lawyers will not exploit it to loopholes of that inability of adequate resources to make the rules work. And sometimes you might, some things we call technicalities, I don't want to believe they are technicalities. I will tell you a very good example. There is this appeal matter in which I've done. Oh. I think he's having connectivity issues. And the hello, Muyo. Yeah. Okay, good. Carry on, carry on. Yeah, he now filed another brief to the Supreme Court that it was technical justice. So my question is that how does it become technical when the rules are provided that you have to file an appellant brief between a certain period? 
you did not file the appellant brief. The respondent in their respondent brief made it an issue that your appellant brief is out of time. And at that time, you still had the opportunity to regularize, even when the appeal was being had, when it was clear to you, but you ignored it. And at the end of the day, you now see that this is technicality. So the rules are there to guide us because at the absence of the rules, there would be a, it would be a situation or it would be a free for all. And so because the practice is one that we have to abide by set rules regulation, and these central regulations, they are also a design to make sure that everybody gets justice, that access to justice is not just something we mention in mouth, but something that is practical and something everybody can see. So I think the problem, why people still feel that the rules of court are matters of technicality and they do not get justice is because we do not see the practicability of those rules. But I believe by the time we have more hands on deck, we have more judicial officers, and we have more and highly skilled court registrars, and maybe at least those working in the registry of the courts, we need to improve the qualities of those people and make sure that there are people who understand the rules. Because if you get to, I'll make an example of the Lagos State High Court. So by the time we get to the court registry, and um, you all have to, and you have a problem with filing a matter, you all have to wait to see the CMB, this year, the Deputy Chief Registrar, because in that old registrar, in that old registry, he is the only lawyer. So you have to take cues, and maybe that is attending to one matter and is attending to another matter. So by the time you have more quality and at the court registry, people who are skilled, who are lawyers, they can they can interpret the rules of the court and they can give life to the intentions of the Chief Judge who made those rules of the court. And again, one thing I tell people again when we discuss rules of the court is that there is the there is the thinking that the rules of the court is obsolete and that the rules of the court should be reviewed almost every year so that the practice of law and litigation generally can meet up with the global standard. And I believe, yes, it has to be reviewed, but the review does not have to come, does not have to affect the rules of the court. So that is why you see most times the court makes practice directions. These practice directions are issued timely and maybe yearly so that those aspects that are developing, the developing trend can be addressed without having a complete overhaul of the court rules. Because for you to overhaul the court rules as a whole, it takes a lot of time. And it is still the same justice who are taking cases on a day-to-day -day basis that bears the responsibility of, of reviewing these court rules. So that is why I advocate that the use of practice direction be encouraged. And if you ask a lot of people, they do not even know that there are a lot of practice directions that addresses things they think are technicalities, that addresses time you have to file, that addresses the cases that you have emergency and how you can best approach it. So I think what we need is that better human resources, better human capital to address the issue of the rules of court, because the rules of court, to some extent, are as a matter of which to provide easy access to justice, and there are no way there is there is like, and the rules of court is an enemy to access of justice. It, the access of justice, even more than waste that you can imagine. So I think I would stop there for now. Thank you very much, Moyo, for a very thorough answer. Um, um, flowing from what Moyo said, um, Christopher, I would like to come back to you. Um, on, on still on the issue of procedural technicalities and irregularities, um, do you think there should be it should be sufficient grounds to strike out matters, and doesn't it open an avenue to some practitioners to sacrifice speed, effective determinations on the merits of a case for you know um, mere technicalities? Thank you, Ridwan. And um, I'd like to say, indeed, uh, Mr. Moyo was very, very, very thorough. So I, I should ordinarily not say anything anymore. <laughs> but, uh, well, I, I think I, I, I agree with him to a very large extent. On the face of it, most of the rules, I mean, the rules of court and, you know, procedures are actually 
they don't really when I mean when the chief judge was signing or when the judges sat down together to to come up with those rules, they didn't have you know technicalities at the back of their mind. It's just to the overriding objective of most of those rules is to achieve substantial substantive justice. That if you check in fact most of the rules rule one or that one rule one that's what it states it will tell you the objective. That's what most of the rules contain. So, but I think the, the problem we have just, I'm coming to your question. The problem we have most times is from whose perspective are you viewing, you know, the interpretation or the use of the rules? There are times when counsel, there are times when you know your client doesn't have a case. Yes, you are a servant at the, uh, I mean, to, in the temple of justice, but you still have a primary duty to your client. You know your client doesn't have a, a, a case, but there are lawyers, there are, there are different extents that each lawyer can go you know, to make sure that they achieve the end that their client is trying to, you know, to secure their client's interest, whether to frustrate an ongoing dispute or not. You know, so there, there are times when also the judge is scared because, as I said, it's an adversarial system. The, any little thing, if you're insisting on the rules, one person is crying. If you want to, you know, um, if, if the court wants to deviate from the express provision of the rule, another party is crying, fair hearing, I'm going on appeal. I'm going on appeal. And then the next thing, the judge is, is scared that he doesn't want his judgment, you know, every of his judgment being upturned. He doesn't tell well for his promotion and all that. So, but for me, I, I have, I feel like, depending on the situation, but what, what the court should be guided by should be trying to achieve substantive justice. There are times when I feel, because the, the court is not actually bound by the rules. I don't think courts are bound by their rules. They can actually, the court is a master of its own procedure. The rules are actually, the rules are applicable, but to some extent, the rules even allow the court sometimes to deviate to make sure that it achieves substantive justice. So I'll give you some situations that have been very fun. There was one case that we went to, you know, here in Delta State, we went to another town to, you know, to defend on behalf of the state. And when we were in court, the, the case was the, that matter was actually moved from one court to another, from a division of the High Court of the Delta of Delta State to another division. Then we got to court that morning, and um, the because it can it has a political undertone. It's a chieftaincy dispute. Counsel for the Z plaintiff now raised claimant raised an objection to our appearance, saying we did not file. Uh, we had not filed a memorandum for conditional appearance that we've not filed at all that by, by virtue of that can you hear me yes proceed hello yes we can hear you can you hear me we can hear you we okay hear he you. said by, by he said by virtue of the fact that we did not file a memorandum for conditional appearance that we are not proper before the court so we had to it was a it was a very hostile one we had to we're trying to inform we're trying to remind both counsel and the fact this let for for the for the, for the efficient and speedy resolution of the of the matter, we have to look at the reason why do people actually file? Why do we file memorandum of appearance? Is to announce to formally inform the court of your intention to defend the action. That's why. Now in this instance, the claimant had already we've, we've already appeared in court previously. He did not object. We had filed our process. Can you hear me? We had filed our yes. process and then we he had responded to our process. Read one. I think yes, I'm I having can hear you. I can hear okay. you. Because on my screen here, my I'm getting a notification that my internet is unstable. So I just want to be sure. So he had he had responded to our our, our process. In fact, it got so hostile that we had to sorry for the interrupting. Uh, sound we had we had to stand down the proceedings go outside the court file a motion for extension of time to uh, file our memorandum of conditional appearance come back to the court after about 20 30 minutes then move the motion he did not object but he knew what he was doing after he said that we did not deem our processes that we, that has been filed previously without our motion, that by virtue of that, that those, those process are incompetent before the court. So it was really annoying, but like we are trying, let's, you are, you are claimant, you don't want to go on with your matter. Mm. So, I mean, it, it depends on who is building or who is in, from whose perspective, you know, you are viewing um, you, the, the rules of court. But there are instances where 
like you said, should should a, 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 um, should we sacrifice you know the substantive or effective um, you know delivery or, or of a particular matter just just because of technicalities? There are instances where the courts or the rules recently have come to curb those. Like before, you could have instances where people would appeal an interim order and go far go as far as the Supreme Court. But now I know that some rules will tell you that once there's an appeal for an interim um, application, the substantive suit would still proceed. So it does not affect the substantive suit. I, I know that the only exception that we have now, uh, there, there are some few exceptions. I know that stay, stay of proceedings for our, uh, to refer parties to arbitration, it's one of the exceptions where the action will actually be stayed. So I, I feel it, it's the, the normal lawyer question I would give is it depends. And it depends on the lawyer. I, I hope I don't have a client that will want to force me to do that, you know. But I, still, it, it it just depends on who is who from whose perspective you are viewing this, you know, the application of or the operation of the rules of of the court. So for people like us who that day were frustrated, that that was mere that was serious technicality that was really irritating. But for him. That was him helping his client as far as he could because he doesn't want the matter to go on even if he's the claimant. So I hope that answers um, you know the question you asked me. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Christopher. It, it, it does, it does. Um, uh, Pernami, I'm sorry I have. You say I've ignored you. I, I'm sorry <laughs> I have. I think it wasn't intentional. Um, I, I would like us to, to talk about, you know, the ICT um, electronic and the electronic filing system. Um, what, what is the role of ICT and electronic filing system in our judicial system, right? And how effective has the introduction of ICT been in dispute resolution in this part of the world? Thank you so much. Um... And I'd like to thank, before I go on, let me thank the CCLS Nigeria branch for inviting me. Now, before I um, go, I mean, you've asked me how we, what is the role and how effective is ICT and electronic um, filing system? For me, I think there's just one role. And that role is an efficient system of adjudication and an efficient justice administration system. Now, I mean, you know, everything is all encompassing into this. So basically the point is that why should we have any form of ICT in our, in our judicial system or why should we have electronic filing? Is to make the, administrat admin uh, the justice administration system more seamless, more effective. Has this been so? We'll get there. Now, of course, um, so, so um, about five years ago or so, the judiciary adopted a policy which you know, allowed for the use of ICT in, in the court system. Now, what they did at the time was uh, they started introducing policies state by state in terms of, uh, of electronic fi filings. Now, what I found very confusing, because at first when I heard it, I thought, okay, uh, this is interesting. It will be like you know, in, in more advanced jurisdictions where I can actually sit in my office and file a document. But it turned out to be to be different. It turned out to be a system where you actually file your physical um, court processes in the court registry, then take it to a room, bizarre as it sounds, take it to a room, they then scan it. You know, so you then begin to wonder, I mean, what's the point? What exactly is it for? And I've been practicing, I have never seen a situation, even after they've been scanning those documents, or so they say at the time where the court has actually pulled up a computer and said, okay, I can see your statement of claim or your writ of someone's online. I'm, I'm yet to see that. So the point is, you know, we, we did try to adopt this policy, but you know, we, I, I, I can't even tell you how effective it is because it's almost non-existent, you know, to those of us in, in practice. Now, um, and, and that's in terms of electronic filing. Now we then had, uh, of course, we had the pandemic, and you know, the whole world was thrown in disarray. And then thankfully our court adopted some virtual hearing protocols. So I, I will go to that. You know, that has again, um, not quite as, as successful as we would have liked, you know, but in some instances there has been um, movement. I don't want to say progress, but there has been some movement in terms of where we're coming from and where we are now. 
Now, of course, you know, the, the, the advantages are obvious. It saves uh, cost. You know, you, you could argue, of course, filing, you don't have to print your documents if we were to be able to do the electro, have a, a, a working electronic filing system. You don't have to print and all that, you know. You know, those advantages are pretty obvious. It, you know, it could provide for an easy and efficient tracking system. It could ultimately result in a speedy administration of justice. And, you know, the one that I, the example that I like the most, it could also enhance the security of court documents. Now, those are some of the advantages if we were to have a working electronic filing system. Now, why I say I like the, um, uh, uh, the advantage of, of it um, enhancing the security of documents is that the classic example is during the NSARS protest or some other, you know, protest that we had, some of the courts got burned. And as the courts got burned, the files in the courts got burnt as well. And then, you know, of course, months down the line, they started asking lawyers, oh, you know, you need to bring in your office copies to reconstitute the files in those courts. Now, of course, if we did have an electronic filing system, or oh, well, in Lagos, they say that we, 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 we have something of the sort, if it was an efficient system, you don't need my file copies or the other party's file copies to constitute your case. You should have already had those documents in your system. So, I mean, you know, those are some of the advantages that we are yet to harness. Now that's in terms of, uh, of, of having, you know, electronic filing system. Like I said, the advantages are pretty clear, but, you know, I mean, what the way that I would like to approach this is, you know, to, to talk about what can be done, how can we, what exactly should we be thinking, you know, in terms of having an efficient system for, for an efficient justice administration system. Now, the judiciary, whether we like it or not, has to harness technology, so technological solutions. There's no other way to do it, to solve some of the challenges that some of us have identified here. The courts are congested. Matters are going on for you know, since Isaiah was born, matters have been in court for, 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 for reasons best known to our system, you know. So, I mean, for me, it's just that, you know, we, we need to answer certain questions. First, are we able to fully automate our systems or have a system, um, for instance, where, you know, in, in terms of virtual, let, let's, you know what, let's break it down into virtual hearing and electronic filing. Before I go into virtual hearing, let's do um, and then let's have an electronic filing system. Now, are we able to fully have a system that works in terms of me sitting in my office and filing a document? What technology is required for that? What funding is required for that? And how are we trying to deal with it? You know, now, I mean, in, in terms of that, you know, when I go into the next one, you know, we probably will get more clarity with that. Now, when we go into uh, um, virtual hearing, again, the same questions will arise. What technology are we putting in place? Again, are we trying to fully automate our systems? Where, you know, and I, where, for instance, if everybody cannot come to court on one day, you know, limited matters are there, which can be taken virtually, and the rest can be taken in person. Now I say this because, I mean, as a dispute resolution lawyer, I know the argument about the court wanting to see the demeanor of witnesses in the witness box and about the importance of people being physically present in court. I understand that quite well, you know, so are we able to have a system where, for instance, the court say, you know, when it's time for hearing, let, um, uh, you know, let the witnesses be in court, but if it's not hearing time, let's do every other thing um, uh, via virtual means. Of course, that will save everybody's time. I don't need to go to court for a motion for extension of time. I don't need to go to court for a motion to amend where the other party is not, is not opposing. You know, there are some innocuous applications that can be taken from the comfort of my office. So are we able to have systems in place where, you know, we can actually work towards uh, um, achieving these objectives? and then perhaps have like the trials taken in court. You know, um, of course that saves everyone's time because I know that I can just log into court at 9.15 if it works and take my motion for extension of time or whatever and move on. But even be that as it may, even though I have mentioned the advantage and you know, the benefits of you know, a witness being in court, 
so that the courts can monitor demeanor, you know, and all those arguments that we dispute resolution lawyers like to make. We should not gloss over the fact that there are certain courts right now who are actually taking trials through virtual means. And we must commend those courts, right? So for instance, we, we must commend the National Industrial Court, I say this, because they, you know, I always say the NIC is sometimes a bit more advanced than the rest of the, of the, of the other courts. And it pays off because there's a lot of smooth administration of justice there, fast administration of justice. Now for the NIC, you can be abroad, you know, and still have your hearing, you, and still your, your witness can be abroad and you can have like a seamless virtual hearing. You can also do it at the, at the high court, you know, but I've seen it done more and more efficiently at the NIC. So we, we have to commend them. Now, in terms of the infrastructure required to have this sort of system, are we open? Because I know the problem would always be funding. Can we fund a system where, and I'm, not, I'm talking about from the government side now, not in terms of access to justice. Now, in from the government perspective, can we fund a system where we have a virtual hearing platform, a, a functional um, um, document filing or electronic filing system? If the answer is no, if the government can't fund it, then can we throw it open to the private sector and have some sort of uh, a public private partnership such that the infrastructure required is adequately developed and maintained, you know, by the private sector, but of course for the consumption, you know, of all of us. Now these are options that could be explored, but you know, there, there will definitely be downsides to it. When the private sector bears the cost of this infrastructural development, who later bears the cost? It will be the litigants. So these are where you know the access to justice um, issues may arise. Will such a private uh, a PPP arrangement will it, for instance, drive up cost of filing? Will it, for instance, drive up um, you know the um, the um, cost of a matter in general? You know, Falao had mentioned how you assess a matter in Lagos State by filing. Will those costs increase just because you know? There's now private uh, PPP involvement, and of course, they need to get their money. So those are some of the things that we need um, that we need to consider. Now, of course, we also, you know, cannot gloss over the fact that, in terms of access to justice, not everybody is going to have a functional internet. Not everybody is going to be able to afford it. Not everybody is going to be have easy access to a computer or whatever, you know, to be able to do their filings or, you know, even the virtual hearing. So is it also possible, as, you know, some of the ways that we could do it is to have systems where, for instance, when you're filing a process in court or when you are instituting a matter on behalf of a client, perhaps we throw it open to, your, to the litigant and to the lawyer to say, look, you know, is your client able to afford so uh, virtual hearing proceedings is your client able to afford electronic filing all through you know so that for those types of cases or for those types of clients we leave that option open and say look you know for a case against for this particular case against party a and party b they're going to have virtual hearing where most of the time they're going to do electronic filing and they can bear the cost of that whatever the cost is now for another case where parties say look i can't afford it to you know we then leave them to come to court i mean these are options that we could think about but you know but and 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 we need to think about it so that we don't you know cut out anybody from justice i mean you know, then everybody must be able to go to court, frivolous as the case may be. And I hear the arguments that have been made. Many cases are frivolous. But unfortunately, the way that our system has been designed so far, the court must hear every court, every case that comes before him, right? And determine whether it's frivolous or not. So, I mean, you know, there are conversations that need to be had in terms of an effective ICT system that ensures that there's access to justice um both to the people of means and even access to justice to people that want to have their matters determined within a very short period of time as we have identified uh, justice delayed is justice uh, uh you know <laughs> yeah it's justice denied so if you know if we are doing it in arbitration where everything is done uh, you can do everything virtually file everything we don't see any reason why in six months time, you can't file and get and get a judgment. So, I mean, like I said, the, the advantages are obvious. It's just how to get to this point that I think we need to consider. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pernami. Um, I want to see something, just to back her up on something. Okay. Yeah, I was actually gonna come to you. 
Yeah, yeah. The, the point is, I think the most basic thing there that I still find very strange is that why we have not made the system of filing self-operative in Lagos State. The examples you cite in there, why do I have to print copies and allow someone to scan them to upload them? That is the most, that, that is very strange. I still don't understand why it is not self-operative because I believe that is the first step. Lawyers have now embraced technology in various areas. I think um, I was speaking with someone and it says in their office now, they are trying as much as possible not even to use paper. This one, that like you don't have to print something for someone to approve. Everything is done. You send me an email, I respond to your email, and there is a problem. And so I think that is the first step the, the administrators must do, the, the registry, that it must be self operated We don't want to be coming to the registry. If I can sit in front of my computer, if I can upload my document, I don't even have to print. We've gone to the stage, everybody has an electronic signature. Some people have even devised a means of scanning their NDA seal that they will just put it. They don't have to apply for extra copy. I saw one one that was, and I was asking the person, how did you do this seal that it appears this way? So you don't have to go and extra, apply for extra copy. They just scan it and immediately they place it on their PDF document and they send out the email. So again, and I think we lawyers too, and those of us who have embraced technologies, we must spread the gospel to other people. I was in a transaction with a lawyer, and the lawyer is always demanding that. Even if I send email, he will call me that I have seen your email. Please send the ad copy. And I will be. Moyo. Oh, well. Wow. I think I think we I think we lost him again. And that, and that was such an interesting point. Yes, yes, actually. It's like when you've seen the app. Oh, wow. Hello, Muyo. Don't send me a physical copy. We, we, we begin to share that idea to me. I follow this process. I do not have to come and serve you the ad copy in your office. Would you accept me scanning the copy that I filed and sending it to you via email? We lawyers, we must be able, if we can start that process within ourselves that, okay, if I'm serving you my counter for that with via email, you are not going to get to court and say, no, I have not been served the copy. So by the time we can start exchanging those ideas within ourselves and as lawyers, as counsel, as opponents, we become familiar with the process. And we are saying that we are telling the court who oh, have received the service via email, I have received it via WhatsApp. I think we become conscious. And by that time, by the time we are now embracing the technology, it will not be so difficult. That time, you are also speaking to your clients that, ah, um, the plaintiff, don't worry, this is how it get done, and there is no problem with it. So I think I will just hear them. She made a very brilliant point, but the first thing we need to do is that the system must be self operated and we as lawyers, we must also embrace the system. And that's what I was going to point out. Thank you so much, Muyo. You, you, the point is very, very interesting. I mean, uh, I, on my own part, I have, a, there's a financial institution we currently work for. When we send emails, they still request that, okay, so when are we going to get the hard copy of the letter? I mean, it's, it's like you're working backwards. Well, th thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now, uh, based off what they've said so far, for now, I'd like to come to you. Now, uh, we have identified um, the problems uh, we, regarding ICT and e-filing, but how do you think we can leverage um, tech for timeless dispensation of justice and also access to justice? Um, thank you, Tolad, for, um, for this question. Um, yes, yeah, so um, Perinami has made um, a very important point on, you know, you know, why it is important for us to, you know, leverage on ICT, you know, and also how, you know, it has a significant impact on, um, on, um, on access to justice. And um, I think that, you know, um, I think one thing that I think we all would agree is um, the, um, the pandemic, you know, highlighted the need for us to, you know, reform, you know, our judicial system, or rather to, you know, accept, you know, the use of ICT, you know, in the dispensation of justice. You know, before then, you'll have seen, you know, one or two futuristic articles that I've talked about, 
you know, how the legal system would embrace ICT and um, I mean, those, those sort of, you know, rights are generally, you know, ignored by, you know, stakeholders or uh, stakeholders in the legal profession. I mean, some of our judicial and legal bodies. But I think when, you know, um, lawyers were at home for several months, you know, litigants were not able to litigate their claims. I think um, that, you know, brought to the, you know, forefront the need for us to, you know, develop the systems. Like, um, Lagos, um, as we know, Lagos and um, APT, you know, um, do take that, you know, matter before the Supreme Court. And then the Supreme Court actually endorsed, you know, the, the um, endorsed, you know, the use of ICT, you know, for hearing of cases and all of that. You know, but as of today, you know, having um, the, I mean, the pandemic being, you know, over in some way and then, um, you know, having gone back to physical hearings, we're not hearing too much of, you know, virtual sittings anymore. I still hear, you know, every now and then, I still have one court or the other that, you know, is having um, physical hearings, um, like the um, NIC as alluded to by um, Perinami. Um, so the other thing I think, you know, the other reason why I think that, you know, now more than ever before, that um, these systems need to be put in place, um, the server operating systems, as uh, Moria said, is also the insecurity that we have in the country. You know, I have an, um, um, a colleague was giving me an eyewitness account of what happened in you know, one of the states in the north. Um, this was about two weeks ago, where um, a senior advocate of Nigeria was making submissions in court. And then um, bandits actually entered the courtroom and then um, asked everyone to leave. You know, I'm, I was even like, they're so fortunate they were not even kidnapped, you know, anything like that. So. Essentially, that court has been shot. There are several states in the north where um, uh, the company that I work for, you know, we have cases there, but those cases are not, um, those cases are not, you know, making any progress, you know, because lawyers are not able to go to court. Um, in one state, uh, I think, I'm not sure if it's Kaduna, I'm, uh, one of the states in the north is, you know, a number of lawyers have been kidnapped and um, colleagues know because the, MB, um, the MBA in those states you know, would ask members to contribute. And um, some of my colleagues in Lagos have actually contributed, you know, towards the release of lawyers that were kidnapped in some of the states. So if we do have, you know, virtual hearings and, you know, there is technology in the North, you know, that narrative that um, maybe the North doesn't have access to um, the internet infrastructure, well, that's not completely true. You know, there is technology in the North and, you know, um, we, we could have virtual hearings we could have um, electronic filing systems where, you know, people don't have to, you know, go to a physical building, you know, where they can become a target, you know, for some of our cases, you know, to go ahead. So, um, and that, you know, has a direct um, impact on, on access to justice. You know, if, um, if um, litigants are not um, able to go to court, they're not able to you know, file their claims either because of insecurity or because of lack of infrastructure. If, if there are things that, you know, can be done from the comfort of your office and if cases can be heard, you know, substantially. And to speak to the point of, you know, the meaning of witnesses, um, uh, uh, at least there's one case where I was a witness and, you know, we had a witness that was um, in the United Kingdom and um, 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 just that witness, you know, um, the evidence of that witness was taken virtually. Uh, this was at the High Court uh, before one of the judges of the High Court, and this is about two months ago. So that um, that witness, you know, did not need to uh, did not need to travel down, and um, you know, I myself and I think every other person in the courtroom, you know, was able to observe, you know, the demeanor of that witness, you know, with interest. You know, there was no. Uh, I, I think, I mean, for obvious reasons, you know, your video has to be turned on. And um, in the United Kingdom, I think it would be a hard sell for you to say that your internet is bad, you can't turn on your video and all of that. So, but, you know, your video has to be turned on, you know, you'll be able to observe, you know, the demeanor of that witness just as, you know, you would do, you know, if, if um, that witness was physically present. So, you know, I, I do not see why, you know, at this point in time, why we cannot have you know, um, full-blown uh, ICT, full-blown, you know, virtual hearings, you know, employing um, things, um, applications such as Zoom, um, Skype, and then even Microsoft Teams. I think, um, I think we are way, way back on all of those. I think um, courts in the, in the US, in the UK, you know, we can always, you know, 
I mean, there are many things that, you know, we take from them. We can take that as well. You know, um, whatever sort of um, obstacles that, you know, um, we might perceive, they can be effectively addressed. And um, one other thing I think I would say is, you know, for, um, I mean, for any law, for any legislation, you know, we, we do need um, some amount of good faith. And, and that's, just the, that's just the truth about it. Um, we've seen lawyers, I think that, that, that explains the, you know, reluctance, you know, of um, some lawyers and even judges to embrace, you know, ICT, because even with physical filings, you know, we've seen, you know, what some lawyers have do, uh, sorry, sorry, what some lawyers have done, you know, to, to circumvent justice or to sort of escape, you know, the consequences for some actions. Um, yeah, if for instance, you know, I serve a claim, um, I serve a claim by, um, by two emails, I serve a counter affidavit by email and I get to court and I'm telling the court that all the parties, you know, have been served, you know, and all of that. And then um, the lawyer on the other side is saying, um, my internet has been very poor, um, my line was um, bad and things, you know. So we do need some good faith. Um, without good faith, you know, um, ICT, you know, and all of that would just be one other reason, you know, for um, lawyers to, not, not always lawyers, but even parties, you know, and not every party, not every lawyer to try to, you know, obstruct, you know, hinder, block the, the administration of justice, you know, un unfortunately. Um, but that notwithstanding, several arbitration proceedings, we started, we concluded, you know, um, um, through virtual hearings, you know, um, processes were served by email. Um, the hearings were done virtually. The award was, you know, dispatched, you know, by email. I mean, start to finish, you know, no one left, you know, the comfort of, you know, wherever they were. So I think, and that, and not just um, international commercial arbitration, even domestic in arbitration, you know, um, I have been involved in those proceedings and I know that one or two people in the room would have been involved in, you know, those proceedings as well. So I think that, you know, um, and the time was really was yesterday that, you know, all of this, you know, should have, you know, taken effect. And I think now more than ever, um, different state governments, I think Lagos, you know, has been, you know, spearheading some of these developments, you know, I see that Delta State is doing a lot as well. So I think that, you know, some of the states, we, you know, with, um, with um, I mean, what's the word that I would use? With, um, with attorney generals that uh, forward thinking, with, um, with um, chief justices or chief judges that, you know, are also forward thinking, you know, they can take this forward. And I think that other states, you know, would copy, you know, that's legitimate, you know, um, copying. And I think that, you know, a lot of states um, are replicating, you know, what is being done in Lagos State, for instance. You know, if you look at the civil procedure rules, you know, of many states, you know, in Nigeria, you would see, you know, some semblance to that of Lagos, uh, Buja, you know, some other place. So I think that um, we might not, we don't need to wait for um, a bill in the National Assembly or some you know, national legislation, you know, encouraging or mandating, you know, parties and courts to embrace, you know, ICT yes. in all its ramifications. I think we can sort of take that on a state-by-state -state basis, you know, law firms, lawyers, as Moya said, you know, you can begin to, you know, give your colleagues the benefit of the doubt when they say, you know, we've sent you this data by email, you know, and not request a hard copy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olaho. Um, I think at this point, we, we should go into um, the effectiveness of arbitration in the Nigerian context, the arbitration and mediation bill. Um, uh, Pename, I'll come to yeah, you. Before you go forward, I just want to draw your attention. There are some people asking questions. So yes, yes. Maybe no, I, I've, no, I've noted the questions, and I think we'll take the questions at the end of the session yeah, so yeah. we were able to run through the program. Yes, so on the effectiveness of arbitration, um, at this stage of our judicial growth and developments, I mean, I would say our system, our judicial system is no longer a stranger to ADR and arbitration in particular. 
um, in your view, how effective um, has arbitration been within the Nigerian context? Thank you so much. I hope I'm not, okay, I'm not muted. Thank you. No, you're not uh, muted. Thank you. I, I like how you started by saying that it's, uh, arbitration is no longer a stranger because it's true. And I think, I mean, that's like, you know, the most important point that I will be emphasizing on in my discussion. So, but in terms of the question first, how effective is it? Um, the answer that I will give you is highly effective, highly effective. Now, it is, it is effective because I mean, especially with resolving high stakes or commercially sensitive or specific industry disputes. I mean, we've identified here at least that, you know, it could take you years to go to court, right? So in, in terms of um, that kind of advantage, arbitration is faster. So you get your easy access to justice, you know, um, and, and like I said, really high stakes disputes. Again, um, Another point that I like to say in terms of effectiveness of arbitration or how effective it is, even in our jurisdiction here, is that what arbitration does for you is it allows you pick your arbitrator or pick your umpire, right? As opposed to going to court where, you know, you file a claim and, you know, you assign the court a judge, right? So, but in arbitration, you can pick. And where you have like really commercially sensitive matters or where you have matters that require specific expertise, you can then decide and say, look, this is, for instance, the construction um, arbitration, which we think is technical. Let's have a technical expert sit, you know, or, or, um, as part of our arbitrators or perhaps as a sole arbitrator. So in terms of, of those, uh, it, well, with those, you know, you sort of get like a real system that works. You get a fast um, administration of justice, you get a judge or, well, no, you get an arbitrator that you trust, that understands your case. Because, you know, as much as we, we must commend our judges, there are times when sometimes you go before the court and you, and, you know, you feel like, look, maybe there are some sensitivities that the court didn't pay attention to. So generally, it's been an effective system. Now, in terms of how Nigeria itself has made arbitration effective, I mean, we can't have that conversation without talking about that. The first thing is that our domestic, the current domestic arbitration law is an adoption of the 1985 Uncertral Model Law, right? And so clearly, uh, um, clearly we got it right even from the beginning on, in that aspect. We're dealing with, we're, um, we're looking at it from an international perspective, looking at international best standards, best practices, which is why we've adopted the 1985 um, model law, you know, which, I mean, it, 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 ours is still the 1985 that we're still using up till now, hasn't, you know, say for the amendment that's going to come up late that, that's been um, passed by the Senate, we still have the 1985 model law. But it's a, it's a pretty standard law in terms of um, um, general, um, um, general acceptance. Now, again, in terms of how effective arbitration has been, let's talk about um, the Nigerian legislation as, as it is on arbitration and the courts. You know, one of the things I like to talk about is arbitrability. And arbitrability refers to the kind of disputes that you can arbitrate. Unlike the courts where you can basically take anything you like, you know, and go there, right? You can't do that in arbitration. But in essence, our laws in Nigeria don't preclude you from many things. So you can basically arbitrate any type of commercial dispute, save for you know, one or two instances, right? So if it's a commercial dispute, um, the exceptions, one of the exceptions is you can arbitrate a tax dispute. Now, and why I like, I particularly like that, that um, the, the Court of Appeals decision, there were two, but the later decision when he uh, talked about the arbitrability of tax disputes, that case actually made it very clear that look, you know, tax is, uh, you know, because it pertains to the uh, fiscal revenue and all that, it must go to the federal high court because of, the, of our constitution, section 251 and all that. The federal high court has exclusive jurisdiction. But what that case law also said 
was that even uh, was that it's, it's not a blanket ban on on tax dispute so you can't determine for instance through arbitration how much tax should company a b or how much tax should company b, or, or should company b pay right but you can determine through arbitration the um you can let me not say determine you can ask the tribunal to interpret tax disputes so while you might not be able to talk about the fiscal who gets what or what comes to you or what stays or what goes to the state government in terms of interpreting um, um tax dispute it's arbitrable now another important part and i'm saying this just to show you the way that our courts are thinking in terms of accepting arbitration and allowing it to be an effective um, um system you know in nigeria now we must also very importantly look at the attitude of courts right to arbitration now many of us know this one i'm always happy to you know to brag about it is that if you have if you well let me put it this way 90 percent of cases in which you know you have an arbitration clause but somebody has gone to courts to file um, a matter you know in breach of that arbitration clause 90 percent of those cases are stayed in favor of arbitration and again i have to commend our courts for that right so and of course, there's, this is not something that's just happened overnight where the courts look at a case before them and they're like, ah, no, you have arbitration clause, you know, go to arbitration. It's happened because of um, directives by the Supreme Court. Case law, even, we have case law in Nigeria now saying that, look, Nigeria must be arbitration friendly. Case law specifically telling the courts, if a party has filed an action in, in breach of a motion, in breach of an arbitration clause, please hands off and stay your proceedings and go to arbitration. Right. So because of this kind of directives from the superior courts, this kind of policies is now very clear to everyone that, look, arbitration is not actually restricting you from getting justice. Is The point is that if you've chosen arbitration, the Nigerian courts will allow you go to arbitration. Right. Of course, there are some some conditions as long as you have a valid arbitration clause. And as long as another party has not has not taken steps in those proceedings, you know, those are some of the the you know the hurdles that you have to face but as far as i know pre pretty easy hurdles you know so we have a progressive attitude towards arbitration the courts have that attitude um and even and another point that i i particularly like is even in terms of pathological causes the courts have found that no matter how defective or badly drafted your arbitration clauses as long as the, the 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 courts can elicit an intention to arbitrate they will send you back to arbitration now, why this is important is because you often find parties coming to court to say, oh, look, the arbitration clause said um, the seat of arbitration in La is Lagos and the place of arbitration is Calabar. So this arbitration clause is not enforceable. But the courts won't do that, you know, as long as the courts can elicit that look, but you have you had an intention to arbitrate. Just because there's a drafting issue or a drafting problem somewhere doesn't mean that the courts will exercise jurisdiction, you know. And another point is the courts also recognize of course this one is statutory it's in the arbitration act the courts recognize that the tribunal itself has the the jurisdiction to determine its own jurisdiction again more often than not you have parties running to court to say the tribunal does not have jurisdiction but the courts will tell you and like i said it's statutory the tribunal itself has that jurisdiction so don't come to the court go to arbitration to determine um whether there's jurisdiction or not so you know these things sort of show that it's a working it's a system that works and it will continue to work again another many interesting points in terms of recognition and enforcement of awards if you have an arbitration award and you bring it to court, easily it will be recognized and enforced subject to some conditions, which I don't know if I have enough time to go into, but more often than not, easily it will be recognized and enforced as a judgment of the court. Now you have many parties, you know, throwing in many reasons why that award should not be enforced. But again, the attitude of the courts usually is to enforce the awards. In fact, more often than not, the, the, law, the courts of the first instance, the high court or federal high court will not touch that award. If they're going to set it aside, they would allow you go to the superior courts to do that because they just feel, look, you agreed to come here. Why are you trying to set it aside or to refuse the recognition of, of, of that award? There are some exceptions you know, where courts of first instance have done that, but they are, you know, far one, you know, how do they say they're far apart or, you know, what's that? Now, again, there's also court support generally for arbitration. You have the courts, you know, um, if you have like interim reliefs, 
you know, in the aid of arbitration, you can go to court to get them. The court will grant those reliefs if, if it finds it um, justifiable to do so while still preserving or still maintaining that, you know, the arbitral tribunal has jurisdiction over the substantive claim. You can go there to get some other sort of like um, ancillary reliefs to compel a witness and those sort of things. So, I mean, there's a lot, there's so much to talk about. There's in Nigeria, there's institutional support for arbitration. You have an institute, you have the Lagos Court of Arbitration, the Chartered Institute, the CIAB, you know, so, I mean, there's, it's just, it's it's so exciting, you know, for those of us in the sector that to see that, look, there's so much support from every angle. The only people that are not supporting arbitration are the lawyers themselves, you know, but other than that, other I, than I, that, I, I, was about, I was just about to come to that. I was just That's all lawyers, to... but other than that, you know, it's generally an effective system if all lawyers will allow it to work. So, so that yeah. that that's so, my, my view. I, I, I was just about to come to that. I, I was just about to ask Chris Tofa that um, in view of the public perception amongst the lawyers that arbitration is nothing more than a stepping stone to litigation. Um, um what is the the attitude of 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 lawyers to to the acceptance of arbitration well thank you uh once again i, I say for this for this aspect eh, for my when, when addressing this your question i would i play a little devil's advocate and uh, i i agree with everything um Pernamia said but uh, yes, we we have we even did we did we conducted this um, research like an analysis of um, the attitude of Nigerian courts towards um, arbitration related disputes or matters. We published it sometime last year, and we looked at most of the published decisions or uh, in our law reports, weekly law reports, and all that. And we saw that indeed, as Perenami has said, the, the, there's there's the there is the effectiveness of arbitration that we can see, like the award most time, we saw that 75% of challenge applications were actually set aside. So they were like challenge applications to set aside the award were actually like 75% of them were dismissed by the court and not, those awards were not set aside. And in 80% of the time, the court actually enforced arbitral awards up to the Supreme Court. I, I think when the, the, the good thing is, when you commence arbitration, have the likes of Peranami, have the likes of Mr. Isaiah Bozimo, the Funky Adikoyas, the Mr. Falao, the Mr. Ridwan, and all that, and, and you know, and, and very good practitioners serving as either counsel or and as, a, as an arbitrator. It's actually a smooth process until you get to the enforcement um, proceedings or when you have final contact with the court to enforce that award. It's almost another you know, it's, it's, it's a different story. So from that, our research, we discovered that the problem we have is not really the award, it's actually the contact of parties with the court, the process of enforcing the award or setting aside the award. It's usually too long. From what we saw is that from the, from the time when you institute an action up to when the Supreme Court, when you get either, when you get your judgment from the Supreme Court, either for enforcement or for challenge, it's close to 10 years, <clears throat> you well, know, I and I barely took a couple of weeks. Yes. So, I mean, it, it, so you understand in, in the real sense without being, um, you know, too pro arbitration because I'm, I'm one of the, I want arbitration or being too unrealistic. You understand the sentiments that are expressed by some lawyers when they say oh, it's like a stepping stone when we go back to court. But as Pernamia has already, you know, pointed out, sometimes it's actually the lawyers that still cause these drawbacks. You have a lot of adjournment, you have a lot of, um, you know, um, unnecessary applications. Like the first we have, we have, we have this instinct. If there's an award against your client, the next thing you are going to challenge it, whether you have a good, ground for challenge or not you see if it, if when during that our research we saw that a lot of reasons or grounds for challenge applications are so frivolous like extremely frivolous that you i think there was even one there was, i can't really remember there was one very ridiculous one that we came across in a case i can't really remember now but i, I think the, the problem is i mean how the solution to that is still with the courts 
the courts have tried. I mean, Onoge actually released practice direction in 2015, and we have a lot of practice directions. You know, our courts have the pro arbitration mentality. But what if we can take arbitration? This might be people might be saying we have. Uh, I mean, this is me pushing pushing it too far. Or if they can take arbitration awards as serious as we take election petition, then I'm I'm serious. If we can if we can try that. The next question I'm sure another lawyer on the call wants to ask me is that what about criminal proceedings? Why will you, why will it be election petition? Why, why should it be arbitration over those kind of proceedings or fundamental right applications and whatnot? But if, if you look at other countries that are pro-arbitration and then because this arbitration or even Nigeria as a seat increases revenue for lawyers and also the country. If you look at England, most times their decisions are usually commercially sensitive in nature. So both as to time, so I feel like things that our court should consider is first is that it's international arbitration. Any of the decision that they give will go through international scrutiny. People are actually going to check it. People read to know why should they appoint Nigeria as, as their seat. How are they going to know if Nigeria is a competent jurisdiction for that? They check our judgments and see whether it reflects current practice, check the duration of time. These are the things that they tell their clients before so that we don't see situations where a person, a Nigerian, or a big company in Nigeria is going to Zurich to, as the seat of arbitration and denying you know, Nigerian practitioners of revenue. Then secondly, the, the courts should look at the commercial nature of, of arbitration. The fact that it's businessmen, they want this thing done with. And thirdly, the courts should also sympathize with parties, parties who have chosen not to go to court in the first instance. They should not be, you know, subjected to the same rigors of litigation that they were trying to avoid in the first instance. You get so if if you put all this consideration together, like currently, I'm I'm doing a personally I'm doing a research on Singapore, and it takes roughly one year to decide a matter at the high court. Then it takes another probably roughly one year again, less than sometimes six months to determine another, you know, to to appeal and get judgment at the court of appeal. And then the matter stops at the Court of Appeal in Singapore. It doesn't go beyond that. You know, so and once, once and everything is done quickly, and you see even in their judgments there that the court is very sensitive of the commercial nature. So most of what they do, they know that it has a ripple effect on their economy. They take it so seriously. So I feel we are, we are, we are actually on the right, we are, we, are, we are towing the right direction, but there's still a lot that we need to do both from council and also the court. You get so for stay applications, we see instances where we see some conflicting decisions, some courts. So we see some decisions where the court will say, okay, you have to show us that you've taken concrete steps to commence arbitration. And some other decisions where the court will say, um, you know, you've taken steps and the steps that you've taken steps in the proceeding, and that step is that you filed a preliminary objection or that you did not ask for, you know. They are, so if, if we harmonize some of these things, I, I think we should commend the courts firstly, and also, um, you know, the Nigerian legislature or our current government, especially with the passing of the uh, arbitration and mediation bill by the house mm -hmm. and the, you know, remarkable reforms. But if we don't address this issue of time, I don't think we would that we will get um, so far or it's the, the narrative will change you know drastically that that's a very very big problem that i think is uh, you know affecting uh, arbitration or the pro arbitration nature of uh, of, of nigeria so <clears throat> that's thank that's you. my uh, two thank cents you, thank you so much christopher yeah. well, if, I may add, if i may add <laughs> <laughs> before i come to you for now um i i, I want to go to moyo uh, you're telling I me know, that i have to close i know <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so I, I know I know Moyo has very a very very interesting contribution about this this particular topic. Moyo. Yeah. Thank you, Rigon. I, I think mine is more question, and I think I want to ask very on this question. Do you think we stand a danger? Of falling into a pit wherein arbitration becomes too ubiquitous? Because lately I have now seen almost every agreement, an agreement for maybe a sum of maybe 5 million naira, 10 million naira, and you are seeing an arbitration clause in it. And when somebody is giving me that, ah, just look at this agreement for me. That's the first thing I go. I go to the dispute resolution state, and I would see that you appointed the arbitrators for a, an agreement that it may be at the end 
Now, actually, do you know what is going to the arbitrators? What are you going on? So I think there is the present danger here that we might be falling into that because everybody seems to be embracing arbitration now and saying it is faster. We want to choose those who will be the arbiter of our case. I don't want to get to court. I don't want to get stuck in court. So how do we address that situation that not everything, like, because when you started your discussion, you mentioned things, things that I like, but these are for high stake and specific industry disputes. So how do we make sure that we do not, we try to make it, I don't want to use the word exclusive because it may not be the right word to use, but how do we ensure that we try and confine ourselves so that it doesn't become something that is ubiquitous and at the end of the day, it is now going to lose its values because like we've made examples of various jurisdictions across the world, Singapore, England and the United States. And we can see that the arbitrary, the matters that go to arbitration state, these are matters with very specific things. And so how do we ensure that within as everybody to embrace arbitration, we want courts to give favorable judgments in these? How do we make sure that it doesn't become ubiquitous? That's okay. one thing I think. Oh, okay, let, let me quickly, okay. Thank, thanks, Moyo. I wanted to, before I answer your question, I wanted to give an example. I had a matter like that that I was dealing with. Very small claim. They chose ICC arbitration in the agreement. <laughs> Maybe three arbitrators or something ridiculous. And of course, when I told them that this is ICC arbitration, no, the deposit you will first of all pay for this ICC arbitration is higher than the whole value of this contract. You know. So the point is, there are many cases that have ended up in court just because parties could not go to arbitration. You know, so that's that's a point, and every, everybody understood in that case. But to answer your question specifically, the um, um, there's something called small claims arbitration, right? And you have like the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. I think even the Lagos Court of Arbitration. They have just like the way we have small claims um, court. They have like um, 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 that sort of um, system where if you have a small five million naira arbitration, you know, you know, you can actually institute it using that small, under the small claims rules and using that small claims arbitration mechanism where, you know, everything is calculated according to the value of your contract and according to the value um, of your claim. Now, notwithstanding, I still, I still agree that, you know, maybe we, sh we should be towing more in line of in line of arbitration, again, to the congest our court. Don't also forget that arbitration is only dealing with commercial contractual cases, right? So, but when you go to court, you have torts, you have, a land you have landlord and tenancy, you have criminal matters, you know, you have so many matters that you may not be able to bring to arbitration. But in terms of those kind of commercial contractual transactions, I think we can still maintain arbitration as a preferred forum, but parties need to understand and lawyers also need to understand, especially at the drafting stage, what to do so that you don't make the mistake of putting ICC arbitration for a contract just for me to supply something of 1 million naira down, down the line. So, you know, I mean, for I mean, things for, like that, we have the small claims um, arbitration that that already exists and can assist parties with that. So I'll leave others to answer the question since hands were raised. <laughs> yes, uh, for, for now, I see your hands, your hands are raised. Yes, uh, Tola, thank you. Yeah, so um, I think I was, I was already going to say something before um, Moyo you know, asked those questions. Mm -hmm. So. Um, no, essentially, I, I think that, you know, the government, you know, the federal government, you know, state government do not, you know, understand, you know, the importance of arbitration and the correlation that, you know, arbitration has with, you know, foreign direct investments. Because if they understood, you know, how the mind of an investor works, they would know that, you know, investors have advisors and um, they would look at, they would look at the end, even from the beginning. So they are not just looking at, you know, the prospects of, you know, having a mining lease or having an OML and OPL or whatever, you know, they are looking at, you know, the possibility of disputes and the fact that, you know, the, um, in whatever case, you know, where the investment is, you know, located in Nigeria, you know, they would need to sort of submit to, you know, a legal system in some way, because even ultimately, you know, the assets that, you know, from the subject matter of disputes is in Nigeria, you, you would need to leverage on the, you know, on the Nigerian judicial system. So I did see, you know, um, I think snippets of the bill, you know, I haven't seen, you know, what 
what was event, what was finally signed, you know, but I think one of the things that, you know, I'd hope to see, you know, is an arbitration court. And that's honestly not too much to ask, you know, if you understand that we need investment and then we need an effective, you know, dispute resolution mechanism. So, I mean, for the lawyers that do not support arbitration, they do not understand that, you know, when you have investments or when you have investors, invariably you would have a party from Nigeria, you would have counterparties that are from all over the world. And they should also understand, or they should, or they ought to understand that, you know, there is no um, foreign party that is going to agree to submit to a Nigerian court. You know, that's definitely not going to happen. So, I mean, whether they like it or not, arbitration, you know, has come to stay because we do live in a global, you know, economy where you would have, you know, interactions from all over the world. And the only way to effectively resolve those disputes is through arbitration. And I think, you know, that simple fact still eludes a lot of lawyers and some and judges sometimes. And one thing that I would say that I think um, um, quite a number of lawyers and judges do not understand is that when you look at the New York Convention, the New York Convention is actually a convention, you know, as 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 it's um, as I mean as it's as, yeah, as yes. I mean as it's obvious basically, you know. So and um, although it was domesticated, you know, into Nigerian law. So the Arbitration and Conciliation Act, you know, um, it was ratified, it was domesticated into it. And so when um, matters of stay or enforcement, you know, come before Nigerian courts, you know, what they are looking at, they're looking at the Nigerian rules of interpretation, they're looking at Nigerian law, and they actually, the fact that it's a convention, you know, consistently eludes them. And being a convention, you have to, you know, you have to interpret it in accordance with the Vienna Convention, I think Articles 31 to 33. And what you see in those articles is that when you are interpreting a convention, the primary um, resource that you should consider, you know, in, in, the, in the interpretation is the aims and objectives of the convention. So there are other sources such as the the write-ups and then um, the the materials that we, that were written, you know, leading to the signing of the convention. So when you are interpreting, for instance, um, um, the, the I think it's um, part I, I can't remember what part it is that you know domesticated the um, New York Convention. So when when a judge is interpreting that, um, you shouldn't necessarily resort to Nigerian case law, you know, to interpret those provisions. You know, you, you, you should interpret it in accordance with the aims and objectives of the New York Convention, which essentially is pro arbitration. And, you know, if that is done, you know, I think some of the cases that have been decided would have been decided differently. So, um, um, arguments that, particularly for, I mean, this, is, this obviously has to do with international commercial arbitration. So, um, arguments that are, you know, that are dilatory, arguments that are, that are local, that are not international. You know, those sort of arguments, you know, and they have to be dismissed, you know, essentially. And that is why, you know, um, you will see jurisprudence, you know, in France, in, in England, where, you know, courts, um, um, awards that have been annulled, you know, at the seat of arbitration, they've been enforced in some of that jurisdiction because those courts consider that the reasons why they were annulled were not international, you know, they were not in line with the aims and objectives of the New York Convention. So, um, I mean, that, you know, that enlightenment, that education, you know, has to be exercised, you know, that the mode of interpretation of those sections of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act, you know, must essentially be, um, be in line with the interpretation of a convention that it is. Um, mm -hmm. the, the other thing that I would mention is, um, and I think that supports the need for having an arbitration court, is um, the fact that, um, I think some of us are familiar with the IPCO case. Um, the, um, I think about three, four years ago, the English court, um, um, I think was, yeah, the English court of appeal actually considered, you know, um, enforcing a part of that award. And that was because, you know, a retired chief justice of Nigeria, you know, gave expert evidence that it could take up to 30 to 40 years, you know, before the question of uh, whether or not, um, the questions that were before the Nigerian court, questions regarding stay and fraud, it would take up to 30 to 40 years to decide that. You know, um, giving that opinion to an English court of appeal, the court was like, it's an interest of justice, you know, to enforce 
you know, to enforce this award, you know, in some in some in some degree or, or a part of the award. So I think that underscores the need. I mean, that opinion might not necessarily be reflected on reality, but it underscores the point that it does take some time to get things through our courts. And we do need investment. The economy is bad as it is. And unless you have you're able to show that you know I'm an investor, if I bring my money into your system, I have a dispute. You know, it's like a marriage and a divorce. You know, no one pays for a divorce, but you do know that you know, it's one of those things that could happen. It's the same way, you know, in, in structuring your agreement, you have to pay particular attention to dispute resolution. So that is why you should have a court where anything you know related to arbitration. You have separate rules. Lagos State tried to do that, you know, the, with the Lagos State arbitration law. You know, although the law has, you know, some of its problems, but what they tried to do was when you file an application in court, you must follow the rules that are annexed to the courts. So if we have a separate court, we have separate rules, you have forward thinking arbitration practitioners, you know, sitting in some of those courts. You know, I think that, you know, we will see the progress that we do need to see in arbitration. And um, I know that we're running out of time, just one or two other comments. Um, with regards to small claims, I think that, you know, um, transactional lawyers, you know, as is often said, should consult, you know, their dispute resolution partnerships, you know, when drafting some of the dispute resolution clauses that they draft. Because there are many sort of intuitive ways that you can reduce costs for your clients. You know, I've been involved in an arbitration, I was registrar, the claim was roughly 20 million, you know, it was a cheap arbitration. The arbitrator collected, um, his fees were about maybe a million. You know, my fees as a, as, as a registrar was maybe about 200,000. It was a very, you know, cheap arbitration. The award, you know, was published, you know, and it was very, you know, it was resolved very quickly. So you can have arbitration resolving even small claims, so long as it's structured. I mean, one of the, um, one of the things that I tell, you know, transactional lawyers is, you know, in you sort of stagger the dispute, the dispute resolution clause. So I mean, you can say, you know, if the if the value of the dispute, if the value of the claim is less than, let's say, fifty thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars, you know, put it there. Have one arbitration. Sorry, for now, I, I, let's just have thirty more seconds to round it out. Okay, one arbitration, <laughs> and if it's more than, if it's more than, you know, um, fifty thousand, we can have three arbitrators. Yeah, I think we can't say it all, so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Falao. Um, all right, so let's quickly go uh, to the next topic, which is uh, small claims courts. Um, Perenami, um, the, the, the small claims court was introduced in 2018, and um, as we all know, was spearheaded by legal states. Um, what has been your experience with it, if any? And do you think it has achieved its objective? How effective has it been? Yeah, it's it's been um, quite effective. I know that other states, at least I'm sure of Kano, I'm not sure of which other state has um, adopted that model, but I'm sure of Lagos and Kano. And in my experience, it's been very effective, at least for claims um, of 5 million and below, right? And it's been effective because um, you, you, you are supposed to actually get judgment within 60 days. More often than not, it may not be 60 days, but you do get a judgment um, in a very short period of time. Now, another thing I particularly like about the small claims court is that, because as the name implies, it's small claims, right? Parties may not really be able to pay lawyers and all that. I mean, you have a claim for 500,000 perhaps, you know, how much do you want to pay your lawyer and all that? So the rules allow you to represent yourself. And the way that it's been structured is it's not like our typical court is that you actually do get assistance along the way. You know, when you go to court to pick up the form to start a small claims matter, the, the um, guys at the registry are there to assist you with filling your form, basically holding your hand, um, holding your hand all through. So it, it's been an effective process. I really like the model. You know, um, and I, I know that, you know, at least from the records that I've seen, from the data that I have, as of 2019, the Small Claims Court had delivered 530 judgments out of 850 uh, cases that had been filed. By now, I'm sure obviously the numbers would have increased, you know. So they're doing, they're doing pretty well. The downside, however, is that, you know, um, they're short staffed, just like the way that we have for, you know, as it runs across the judiciary generally, you know. So because of that, they're getting overstretched. Initially, when they started, really, you could actually get a judgment within 60 days. They were bragging about it, but I'm not sure 
anymore about the 60 days thing. Still, you still get it in a short time, you know. So um, they're short staffed, and you know, I mean, if that continues to persist, then they begin to lose their effectiveness, you know. But generally, I found it um, quite effective. Um, it's also been useful because sometimes when people reach out to me and they're like, look, somebody collected 200,000 from me. I'm like, you know what? Don't even let me even start talking about my own fees. Just go to small claims courts. They will give you form there, you know, you go and do it. And they've come back to me to say, thank you. That was a very useful process. So, um, we're running out of time. I, I don't want to take out too much time. Okay, on this. I, I, I realize, I realize. Um, yeah. I, I was quickly going to ask um, um, Moyo, but it seems he's having connectivity issues. Moyo. Yes. Okay. I can hear you. I quickly, yeah, I was quickly going to come to you to, to just uh, talk a bit about uh, the limits on the jurisdiction of the small claims courts. Uh, do you think the monetary jurisdiction should be increased? And what are your thoughts on extending the jurisdiction to other matters other than liquidated money demands? Uh, it seems his, his connection is really bad. Okay. Um, let's, let's just move on. Um, on independence of judiciary, um, I'm going to come to uh, Christopher. Christopher, are you still with us? Yeah, Delta State has given me another life. <laughs> 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 so I hope I don't, I don't, I don't exhaust this one again. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Moyes. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I just, I just. Uh, you can find a way to extend the issues of this one. And this one to at least to in the recovery of premises of some certain you just want to recover a one bedroom a shop apartment you should be able to go and pick out a form a plain form and fill the form put in the necessary we have to look we have to look beyond the five hundred the five million monetary jurisdiction and extend tenancy there is no way we can we can be at the magistrate court with up to two three years i want to recover one shot i don't have to be there for that we move beyond the fire and i think to achieve that the government in some extent must commit resources human resources to the more to the small things got like fairness saturated i am advising someone on the matter on the small thing matter and you won't believe us now we are running into three the same magistrate handling small claims is also handling other courts. So it becomes very difficult for her to schedule that time specifically for the small claim court. So I think what we should be looking at that the small claim court should be a court on its own. A magistrate who do not have to bother about other matters that, other, that the magistrate court has to do channel that. I think until we are able to do that, we might not be able to move the jurisdiction of the small claim courts beyond what it sees presently. Mm. Th thank you very much, Moya. Thank you very much, Moya. Now, uh, quickly to Christopher on independence of judiciary. Um, considering the various challenges regarding the issues of independence of judiciary vis-a-vis -vis funding, uh, do you think independence of judiciary uh, will be nothing but a pipe dream? And um, in order to achieve it is there a need for constitutional amendments to ensure true independence is guaranteed? I know, I know. There's no way to answer it quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Getting uh, <laughs> true independence of judiciary on its own, it's. I know, I know. But just yeah. give us your thoughts. All right. <laughs> okay. So, um, well, <laughs> indeed. Um, I feel like there should be a constitutional amendment, actually. I feel, you know, having constitutional basis or if, if our constitution truly reflects that, then um, that's, that's the best solution. But nevertheless, given how, you know, there's an ongoing constitutional amendment and it has been, it has taken like a very long time. I've seen like some of the proposed amendments and, you know, if, if probably if just one state refuses, then the whole it's a very, very tedious process. 
And given the fact that the major players are other arms of government, I don't know how they might not be able to carry, uh, you know, the cost of another arm. You know, they can only try their best. So it it's not if the judiciary were actually the ones that apart if they are the ones championing the constitutional amendment process, then it probably to be to be done within record time. Because if you ask, ask all the judges or justices if they want true independence, financial independence. I'm sure the answer will be yes. But indeed, um, financial independence, I'll try to be as quick as possible. Um, it, it's, there's no judicial in, in, independence without you know, looking at the, the judicial arm of government being able to manage its own fund you know, without interference or not being the poor brother of the, you know, the executive or the, you know, the relative of the you know, House of Assembly, as the case may be. So in Delta State here, once again, let me just still come down to our own jurisdiction. Um, you know, <laughs> in sometime on the third day of August 2021, we the governor, you know, gave his accent to the Delta State Judiciary Fund Management Financial Autonomy Law. And primarily from that law section seven and eight, you know, tries to achieve these little agitations or you know, call for independence of the judiciary. So what, what we are trying to do, we are still, it's still, we are still, I mean, we are, it's, it's still, it's still like a step in the right direction. We are not yet at the destination, but the purpose of the, the law right now is to make sure that once their allocation, the judicial, the judiciary allocation is paid directly into their dedicated fund. And then that the chief judge has the power to manage, you know, the fund, chief judge of Delta State and the chief judge of, um, President of the Customary Court of Appeal in Delta State, they they they, they manage the fund of, uh, allocated to the judiciary independently. So that that's just um, the steps we are taking in the right direction here in Delta State. So um, I know we are running behind time, so I'll just stop. Yeah, th th thank you, thank you so much, Christopher. And um, quickly, uh, Folau, um, Folau, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Tola. Okay, for now, quickly, um, I just wanted to yeah. get your, your own thoughts on the judiciary totally winning itself from the executive. Okay, thank you, Tola. Um, for now, I said quickly. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Ah, uh, okay. Yes, quickly, yes. So um, I won't bore everyone with um, any long comments, but I think there's just one thing that you know, um, that I have to say, which is my view. And I think um, we've had other people express that view as well. I think we should elect, you know, judges. You know, I think that, you know, the MBA elections, you know, have gone very well. Um, I, I do not see that we have, you know, many complaints because I think um, even when you amend, you know, the constitution, well, depending on the changes, because even if you're going to have you know, judges being elected, it would still take, you know, a constitutional amendment, you know, to, you know, completely, you know, remove the judiciary from the control, you know, of the executive. I think that, you know, we can elect judges, you know, from the, from the bar. You know, I think that, you know, lawyers- I don't know. No, no, no. Okay, soon, I'll soon call you, maybe in the next 10 minutes. Okay. Okay, so I think that I think that lawyers, you know, more than um, anyone else, you know, know that we know the judges that are hard working. We know the judges that are not as hard working. You know, to put it lightly, you know. So I think that we can, you know, elect these judges maybe for a cycle of four years, you know, and that the other thing that I would say, you know, before I drop off is that um, I think that we should not misconstrue the word independence because. Um, there should be checks and balances. You know, we would never see, you know, an article about, you know, independence of the executive because the executive, you know, has all of the power, you know, just that they abuse it and they misuse it. So if we make the mistake of giving the judiciary absolute power, we can be sure that, you know, it's most likely going to be abused. So in as much as we need to take them away from the control of the executive or the legislature, I think we need to give the power to maybe the electorate this time around. And that's why, you know, I would advocate for, you know, the election of judges by lawyers. Thank you. 
Th thank you, Polao. Uh, Christopher, I can see your, your hand is raised. Uh, do you have a quick, quick comment on that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I, I just wanted to say, <laughs> like, uh, Mr. Falano's, uh, you know, idea of appointing judges, like electing judges. Wow. <laughs> that, would be, that would be so extreme, Jesus. Well, nevertheless, I mean, uh, given the fact that even, even uh, the current, the current, um, you know, procedure for appointment of judges is fraught with a lot of, you know, problems. You know, people appointing their sons or their friends, uh, you know, uh, or just anybody who is on their good books. So, but I don't know, I might want to differ. Well, then uh, probably, I mean, I agree with Mr. Folan that indeed uh, we, we need, we need the judiciary actually needs, there needs to be check and balance too. Because I was at an event where like the body of attorneys general of the, of the Federation, all the 36 states, they had, they had this meeting in Lagos at the point and the AG Federation came in and he was uh, he 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 mentioned that even that we are talking about independence of the judiciary was it there? I think it was there or, or another event. But he he said the the judges don't even give returns of how they spent their money. That even right now as it stands, they are they are clamoring for you know um, independence, more independence, more financial autonomy, and all that. But even the extent the funds they've given them to now, nobody. They don't give returns. The CGN does not give returns. The Niger uh, you know, National Judicial Commission, they don't give returns at all. You know, so there are a lot of issues. So it's it's almost like uh, it's not you just patting someone's back. We also need to ask our questions. So that's it. So I'm just you know lending um, a voice to what he said. Yeah. Thank you very much, Christopher. Um, uh, at this point, I think we are at the end, but before we end it, let's just quickly go through some of the um, uh, questions that that's, has been lingering on. Um, the first question is from um, uh, MOD. Um, with respect to good faith, do you, do you not think, for example, that the lawyer requesting hard copies after receiving a soft copy may be doing so to avoid disparities between what he was served and what was found. I think that question is for uh, for Laho. It was when uh, you were uh, talking about um, ICT and um, e-filing. Um, okay, would you like me to quickly respond to that? Yeah, just quick, quickly, let's just run through it. Okay, yeah. So um, I, I think it would depend on the, you know, on the on the circumstance or the sort of system that we are operating. So um, if, it, for instance, in arbitration, you know, when you are, you are filing a claim or you are sending in your submissions, so there's an email trail and essentially you are sending the same document um, to the arbitrators, to the tribunal secretary, to the other parties, you know, at the same time. So there, there's absolutely you know, no doubt as to what has been shared. So if in addition to that, you are then requesting a hard copy, you know, in as much as you, you get a hard copy, you know, but I think the authoritative document should be the document that was you know, sent to everyone you know, contemporaneously. You know, mm -hmm. So in a court setting, you know, if I send you, know, you something by email, you know, if the court is not going to respect what I sent to you by email, you know, if ultimately, you know, what the court is going to rely upon, you know, is a hard copy of what is in the court's file, then, you know, by all means necessary, you know, you, you, you probably should request, you know, a hard copy. So in all of this, I think, you know, the, um, the cooperation of the court or the tribunal, you know, would be necessary. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, another question is on independence uh basically what is the nba doing to make judiciary the judiciary's budgets and fund virtual and automated court sittings we as lawyers should champion this course in the interest of justice moyo do you want to take that moyo i think he's he's gone again Um, okay, Tomilade uh, Shodimu says, to add to Falao's comment, although I came in a bit late, I'd like to add that I have always advocated that states should employ more judges to take interlocutory applications virtually, whilst 
physical and hybrid proceedings should be for trial proceedings. This would definitely accelerate proceedings in Nigeria. In a state like Lagos State, I have always championed or I have always championed in other forums that the current platform for e-filing should suffice. There is a need for upgrade with interface for lawyers. Moyo. Yes, please. Are you are you with us? Yes, um, I am. There was a question that was for you on what the MBA is doing regarding uh, independence of the judiciary, judiciary budget on and to fund virtual and automated court sittings. Yeah, um, I think um, that uh, I, I replied the person that asked that question that we will do with it when we come to the issues of um, independence of the judiciary. And I think when we talk about independence of the judiciary, to some extent, from various aspects and from various levels of the administration of justice and the government, there's been various attempts to make the judiciary independent. In one of the comments and one of the questions raised there, um, Tony was raising an issue about an executive order number 10 that the okay. Supreme Court, that the Supreme Court, yes, yeah, said it was, uh, it, was not, it was not constitutional. And I think that was the part that I think that the issue surrounding the independence of judiciary is something that needs to be addressed constitutionally. Because you would see that it was an interpretation of the constitution that the Supreme Court relied on in declaring the executive order 10 unconstitutional. So I think in areas where the, the NBA, NBA doing, it is not really something I think the NBA can act as advisory, but it is something that the judiciary itself would have to answer. And for the judiciary to be able to provide answers to that question, it must be independent in the real sense of independence. And the only way we can guarantee that is that if there is a clear and unambiguous constitutional provisions that is setting out how the funding of the judiciary should be, and to the extent that it is expressed that the funding of the judiciary should be straight from the federation account. There is no gimmick about it. You don't have to pay it to anybody before it gets down to the judiciary until we have that clear constitutional provision which address that. No, it's nothing I really think the NBA can do because at the end of the day, I don't think the NBA is that buoyant to the extent that it will be able to fund the, the required, um, the required investments for, uh, that the judiciary need. So I think at the overall end, a clear constitutional provision that dictates and demonstrates how far the judiciary can be independent answers all these questions. So it is why I would continue to advocate that yes, we have a constitutional review that specifically address the problem of independence of the judiciary. So we don't have to look for anywhere else to get answers whether or not the judiciary can be indeed independent. Thank you so much, Moyo. Thank you so much, Moyo. Um, at this point, I think we've taken all the questions and we've gone through everything. Um, I would like to thank um, all the panelists and, you know, for your time and your know, valid contribution. Um, Christopher, please uh, send my regards to um, Mr. Buzimo, the AG of Delta State. Uh, I'd also like to thank CCLS Nigerian branch, ADBC and your team. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I mean, it's been a privilege to moderate this distinguished uh, group of experts in their fields. Thank you so much, uh, ADBC. Thanks a lot, um, Tola. Um, Ridwan Bello, thanks to the panelists. I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed this session. Um, I mean, I'm not a dispute resolution guy myself, and I'm pleasantly surprised that I could enjoy and you know follow all your you know comments and discussions. So thanks, uh, Prenami is not here. Uh, I'd like to especially thank her, um, the AG too. I would like to especially thank him, ably represented by um, Christopher. Um, thanks, Moyo. Thanks, um, Fola. And um, I mean, we have other events coming up in the course of the year. Um, we have something on inter internet governance. We have something for um, new students and um, recent graduates. And um, we would also have a, a physical event at some point. Um, thanks a lot for everybody, all the participants. Uh, thanks a lot, Tommy. Tommy was really active in the comment section and his comments uh, you know, uh, you know, enriched the discussion. Um, thanks, everybody, and um, see you 
um, soon or see you at subsequent events. Thank you. Thank you, BC. Thank you, BC. Thank you, Thank for you everyone. Have a lovely weekend. And happy birthday again. Happy birthday. Yeah, happy birthday. Um, <laughs> happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday. Happy birthday, Mr. Folawa and Samoyo. Ipo should drop the location. Okay. The location. Okay. Folawa will be, you know, Folawa will take care of that. I trust him. <laughs> 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 All right, guys. Thank you so much. All right, guys. Have a good weekend.